Firelight shines upon the stone, clearly showing an embossed design of circular corridors. Unlike Hephaestus's forge, this sconce is fueled by a thick, black oil. Oil that appears to have never met flame flares to life, casting a soft glow about the cavern. The oil takes a moment before catching, begetting a fine fire. Milice file caparase. Come, Yuriali. It is time. No. What did you say? I will go no further, and neither will you. I won't let you. You won't let me? You won't let me? I have had enough of your questioning, your endless whimpering. Sister, this must end. Yes, you are right. This must end. <laughs> what have you done, Seno? What was required? Goodbye, Yuriali. <sighs> it takes not but a spark from the torch to give birth to a satisfying book for- As soon as the oil catches, shadows begin a mesmerizing dance upon the stone walls. The oil takes a moment before catching, begetting a fine fire. The torch-lit flame generates a small amount of heat, but offers little comfort to the wayward sailor. After a moment of concentration, Argonus unleashes the Daimon's power upon the Stone Minotaur. The beast crumbles to the ground, its soul never again to maunder dark corridors. The rock in the center of this room has seen the work of a chisel, as if prepared to be a support or stand. Argonus sets his torch into the oil, producing a bright flame within dark holes. As soon as the torch touches oil, flames immediately begin to dance within the brazier. As soon as the oil catches, Shadows begin a mesmerizing dance upon the stone walls. This wooden door, its planks bound by iron bands, contains thanks to the gift of sight granted to him by the witches. Argonus recalls and recites the words spoken by Steno. 
Μίλησε φίλε και πέρασε. As the doors part, the smell of blood rises to greet him. Rattled breathing leads Argonus to a broken form, half hidden against a stone wall within this dark chamber. When the figure finally speaks, a voice is soft and filled with pain. Come no closer, Argonaut, else you be brought low like many men before you. Even though I Uriali refused to let my gaze fall upon them. I offer no excuses, no defense. My acquiescence of my twin Sverno has made me culpable for their deaths as well. Uriali pauses for a moment, catching her breath before continuing. I can, however offer you something else, something you seek. My merciless sister herself. Stheno has used an ancient stone to enter Hades' realm. There, she shall descend to the greatest depths of the underworld and undo that which the hero Perseus set into motion when he consorted with the gods. Steno shall free our sister Medusa from Tartarus, the dungeon of torment. Uriali struggles to continue. Athena was not content with the punishment Medusa suffered in life, so the goddess sent her there to live out eternity with the vile and the wicked. But Steno shall not stop with Medusa's release. No. She shall rip wide the gates of Tartarus and set loose all souls, profane men and dreadful titan alike, until the dungeon is empty and those it held spread like a pestilence upon the land of the living. For this is her vengeance against Perseus, against Athena, against all the gods, on Olympus and elsewhere. Stop her, Argonaut. Use our great horn to lure the mighty bronze giant Talos, for he can bring you to the gates of Hades' domain. Her voice raspy and fading. The Gorgon raises her head one last time. Forgive me, Mother. Let legend lay a wreath of mercy upon my wretched brow. And with that, Uriali, the penitent daughter of the sea goddess Keto, passes from this world and into the next. I am a fool, wandering in a desert, muttering words of salvation and revenge through parched lips. Blindly I flailed about, searching for the blight that has overcome so many, and while each piece of the puzzle led me to water, I simply refused to drink. The Lord Poseidon himself revealed the first, when he spoke of the son of Danai and of Zeus. And while I knew this to be Perseus, I failed to recognize Poseidon's anguish was not bound to the death of his servants, but rather his lover, Medusa. Then the twin Gorgons, whom I had seen in a great vision, while protected from the effects of their dreadful gaze by the eye of the Grey Eye. Did repentant Euryale not say that she wished to mourn her sister in peace? It is now obvious that she spoke of Dread Medusa, a woman that legend reveals fair Athena once cursed to wear a brow of vipers and turn men to stone. 
The goddess herself, when first met, readily admitted her hand stirred the waters of spite and vengeance. Now I see clearly that this sailor must do more than prevent the death of his shipmates. I must stop this dread ripple from becoming such a great wave as to pour unhindered from Hades' realm and drown all I hold dear. The Gorgon Uriali has followed her sister into the underworld, albeit on a different path. Forged in bronze, this large cog is well struck and extremely heavy. This isle is littered with such debris, broken reminders of man's folly. A fantastic creature set at its crown, this wooden harp is a masterwork. Argonus strums the strings, producing a surprisingly melodic resonance. Made of obsidian, this stone is not only smooth, but warm to the touch. At first glance, this boat appears to be nothing more than a child's toy. However, upon closer examination, it is quite familiar. Tis the faithful Argo. His hand shaking, Argonus moves the model of his father's ship from shallow waters to the beach surrounding it. This area on the map represents the temple of the sea god Poseidon. As impossible as it may seem, a dim yellow light beats like a heart within this black stone. As soon as Argonus moves the stone to the temple, the room falters and everything goes dim. As the statue crumbles to the ground, the soul of the village arises and dissipates. Argonus gently moves his disfigured hand, causing the statue to shatter into pieces and fall to the sod. Argonus gently moves his disfigured hand, causing the statue to shatter into pieces and fall to the sod. As the statue crumbles to the ground, the soul of the village arises and dissipates. Argonus watches in awe as he simultaneously destroys the stone body and frees the soul trapped within. Argonus watches in awe as he simultaneously destroys the stone body and frees the soul trapped within.
both the turtle-shelled body of this lyre and its threaded strings are covered in sea salt. A sigh escapes Argonus' lips as he uses the power of the diamond on the statue that was once his shipmate. Stone explodes outward as the statue succumbs to the gift that the diamond bestowed upon Argonus. Once the stone is held within the light, the world around Argonus wavers. If the size of this gold-tipped horn is indicative of the animal from whence it came, the beast must have been enormous indeed. Argonus presses his lips to the horn. While impressive, the deep sound fails to draw out that of which Uriali spoke. The statue dedicated to Hades, Lord of the Underworld, can be found within the temple that this stone, though some features on this sculpture are difficult to discern, taken in its entirety, it is not. Tis a stone map of this very isle. While far larger in life, gracious Hephaestus inhabits a stone statue within a similar temple Hera's temple, set just outside her golden orchard, can be seen here, fashioned of stone. Which god is worshipped within this temple is both curious and unclear. As soon as Argonus moves the stone to the temple, the room falters and everything goes dim. This woman was caught unawares, having been transformed to stone while playing for her god. Unearthly power surges from Argonus's disfigured hand and into the statue. As it breaks apart and falls under his breath, Argonus mutters a prayer to Hades as the diamond's gift destroys the stone statue. Argonus gently moves his disfigured hand, causing the statue to shatter into pieces and fall to the sod. This grand statue would be easily recognized by any man. 
Tis the god Apollo. Argonus is unsurprised when the sculpture of Apollo stirs. After all, he has come to expect such things upon this enchanted isle. What does startle him, however, is how casually the son of Zeus dismisses him out of hand. How is it that a mere sailor may enter my temple and approach Apollo in such a manner, his hands empty of tribute, no song upon his lips? The god's voice becomes despondent. Look about you. All things have been diminished. This sanctuary, once full of music, is now naught but a tomb of silence. I sense that you would require something of me, yet you, a scholar, do not bring me the very thing which my heart desires. Before Argonus can utter a word, the god of music turns away from him, but not before laying a pledge upon the sailor's shoulders. Return with an offering worthy of one such as I, and the light of Apollo may yet shine upon you. As soon as Argonus lays the lyre at the feet of the statue, the god of truth and prophecy awakens once again. Apollo appraises the gift for a few moments before the stone lips part. Though its form is crude, and its strings are found wanting, you have done well to bring this lyre into my temple. And although these days are dark, it shall bring music where none could be found. I would appear a boorish god if I did not offer something in return for this boon. Apollo says, gazing about, seemingly lost in thought. The statue waves his hand, and a heartbeat later, Argonus feels his satchel move. Take this, historian, so you are forever with song, forever with music. Let it never be said that Apollo is not as generous as he is beautiful. A smile forms upon Apollo's face, before becoming unmoving stone once more. Amidst bold heroes, none rose above great Admetus, who now stands bewitched within a husk of stone and clay. Argonus releases the diamond's power, freeing the soul of his friend from his prison of stone. Argonus sets his torch into the oil, producing a bright flame within dark holes. Oil that appears to have never met flame flares to life, casting a soft glow about the cavern. Oil that appears to have never met flame flares to life, casting a soft glow about the cavern.
Argonus sets his torch into the oil, producing a bright flame within dark holes. It would appear to be nothing more than an ordinary skull, if not for the small green glint in its eye. This shell was given by the god Apollo. When put to a sailor's ear, the sound of dark waves can be heard. Above a faint beckoning song. Argonus sets his torch into the oil, producing a bright flame within dark holes. It takes naught but a spark from the torch to give birth to a satisfying flame. Argonus lifts the bronze cog, securing it firmly within the machinery. Argonus pulls the wooden handle, and with a groan of protest, platform beneath his feet begins to move. Fair Athena, 
I have returned. Reveal yourself to me, as your servant awaits. I am here, Perseus. Do not be afraid. Did you accomplish the task I set before you? I have, my lady. The Grey Eye revealed the location of Hera's nymphs, who in turn provided me with the sack you see before you. And what of the other labors? I have fulfilled them as well. Wayne's sandals from Hermes, a dark helm from Hades, and from your father, a great sword. Well done, Perseus. But even all of this will not be sufficient to cleave Medusa's head from her shoulders. A final gift, a polished shield of gold. Use it wisely, else the Gorgon's gaze shall be your downfall. Now go, my warrior, and finish it. As soon as a torch touches oil, flames immediately begin to dance within the brazier. Entranced, Argonus moves unconsciously forward, drawn to the lilting sound of the siren's call. As feet sink into the wet sand, a familiar voice rises above the haunting aria. It speaks to him as a lover might. Hold my sailor, go no further. Argonus is knocked to the earth as a rift opens in the sky and a goddess once again steps into his mortal world, blocking the path ahead. The beckoning ballad momentarily fades from his ears only to be replaced by Athena's words of quiet rebuke. Argonus, she says, shaking her head, her eyes kind. Is this what fair Athena has become? A map maker's keeper? A deliverer of historians? You, of all men, know that no living creature can resist the web that the daughters of Achaloa spin. The Siren's song would surely lead you to ruin. For your sake, and that of your countrymen, I simply cannot let you pass. And with that, Athena, the goddess of reason, becomes a silent sentinel before a stunned sailor of the Argo. Freed from the rocks below, the remnants of a once great ship have washed upon the shore. With heavy heart, Argonus watches as stone falls to the earth, even as the freed soul of the Argonaut rises. Unearthly power surges from Argonus's disfigured hand and into the statue. As it breaks apart and falls, the soul of the poor individual quickly departs this mortal world.
the power of life and death flowing through him, Argonus reaches out and releases the soul of his fallen comrade. Hoping that he has guessed correctly, Argonus removes the heart from his satchel and plunges it between ancient ribs. Sensing its master, the skeleton turns hollow eyes toward the sailor, beats sword against shield, and obediently follows. Argonus places a shell into the palm of his undead vassal. Though neither word nor gesture is exchanged, the skeleton turns and walks obediently toward the shore, even as the goddess Athena fades from sight. When the warrior arrives, the curious look upon the face of the siren quickly turns to horror, as she recognizes the god-imbued power held aloft within fingers of bone. The songstress's eyes grow wide as the fetters of her enchantment break, and her sultry voice wavers. In an instant, her baneful song is pulled from her lips and held fast within the shell. His great task complete, the skeletal warrior returns to its master, a powerful gift cradled within its bleached, outstretched palm. As soon as Argonus takes the shell from the skeleton's bony grip, the Hydra's heart within its breast shatters. Its work done, the warrior becomes quiescent once more, as if awaiting orders from the very gods themselves. This shield, forged long ago in bronze, bears the crest of the Hydra.
Once the stone is held within the light, the world around Argonus wavers. Remembering Euryale's dying words, Argonus holds Apollo's gift to the mouth of the massive ram's horn. The lilting song of the daughters of Achelous pours from the shell, spreading a grand, beguiling melody throughout the valley below. Within moments, the mountain under Argonus begins to rumble and the sound of resounding massive footfalls can be heard over the haunting din. Although he has witnessed many events that no other living mortal has beheld, still Argonus's heart is filled with a terrible awe as Talos appears through the sea fog. Drawn by the siren's call, the bronze giant moves steadily, striding toward the mountain until its massive head fills the arched windows of the Gorgon's lair. Before becoming completely still, Talos extends his hand as if in invitation. Mesmerized by the siren's voice, sensing a finality to his quest, Argonus does not disappoint the giant. With a deep breath, the sailor steps hesitantly onto the immense bronze palm. Argonus girds himself as if bracing for the crash of a mighty wave, and great Talos turns from the mountain and begins moving once again. As the giant lumbers, far above the dark sea below, the air around Argonus becomes heavy and the skies part at the bidding of his guardian goddess. Athena, once again revealed in glory, smiles as she speaks. Argonus, my hero, my warrior. You have done what no man has done before you. Yes, you are nearly there. But where you now go, where Athena cannot, do not lose heart, for my promises are true, and your brethren await you. Again, I say, do not despair, for you have proven yourself time and again, and neither Stheno nor the gates of Hades' realm can hinder you. The goddess lifts her hand in a final blessing, as the rift closes about her, and she fades from view. Fare thee well, sailor of the Argo. Fare thee well. His heart heavy, Argonus' eyes are drawn upwards, where he finds himself beneath another towering mountain, a crumbling entrance hewn into its face. Talos moves his massive hand until it scrapes stone, allowing Argonus to climb down. His task done, the bronze giant turns and slowly walks toward the very sea that holds dear the heart of Argonus. Book 5. These Dark Shores
Stand aside, Charon. I claim this boat in the name of my sister, Medusa, who wails in torment within Tartarus. Only the dead. <laughs> so, Hades' undead pet will not yield to me. I say again, stand aside. So be it. It matters not. These black waters shall carry my vengeance hence. I shall return, boatman, with the hosts of the dead in my wake. <sighs> Argonus contemplates boarding the skiff, but then remembers that the ferryman to the underworld requires a payment for passage. Recalling the stories of Charon and the river of Acheron, Argonus embraces his plight and offers a coin for passage. The ferryman does not move, nor does he speak. Yet Argonus can hear a raspy voice whisper in his head, Only the dead. Made of obsidian, this stone is not only... This lever is nothing more than a sturdy leg. Argonus puts his weight against the wood. As the lever moves, the great stone walls fall. A few moments after the stone touches the light, the world around Argonus begins to swim.
Argonus removes the buckler from his back and carefully places it on the floor. The result is immediate and startling. The shaft of light bounces off the reflective shield, and within moments, the entire cavern is illuminated by an unearthly glow. Although from this vantage only a handful of bones can be seen, there are no doubt many more that cannot. A length of heavy iron chain hangs, even pulling with all his might. Argonus is unable to free the chain from the wall. The rusted chain is no match for the enchanted sword. As iron links fold, a loud crash shakes the chamber, and the horror that was held captive high above settles on the stone floor below. This lad is none other than Leodocus, son of Pero, who in turn was daughter of Nellius. How he entered into this labyrinth shall now forever be a mystery. Argonus feels the power of the Daimon leave him and enter that of his friend. In mere moments, the statue fails, releasing its stone grip on the man's soul. Wandering in a desert? Though these words may never reach the shores of Crete, I will not tarry in my writings, nor shall I abandon all hope. For despite my frailties, my foolish nature, I have found favor in the sight of the gods themselves, and one in particular, a goddess. Who am I that fair Athena would appear before me, clad in glory, full of providence and grace? Although I am but a man, she once again saves me from ruin. For I would have surely walked, beguiled, into the depths of the very sea I have pledged my soul. No, I will not abandon hope, nor shall I declare the lives of my fellows forfeit. For if a goddess finds me worthy of new breath, and declares my brethren yet live, who am I to question? Who am I to contend? And while she remained a steadfast bulwark in times of trouble, an idea formed within me. Though no mortal man can resist the siren's call, mayhap the dead could render her enchantment unavailing. From the mouth of a siren, daughter of the river god Archelous herself, my undead servant drew forth the lilting aria. Thus a great labor, that began with a beating stone heart and ended with a captured beguiling song, was fulfilled. As soon as Argonus moves the stone to the temple, the room falters and everything goes dim.
With heavy heart, Argonus watches as stone falls to the earth, even as the freed soul of the Argonaut rises. Once the stone is held within the light, the world around Argonus wavers. As soon as Argonus moves the stone to the temple, the room falters and everything goes dim. The sailor of the Argo reaches into his satchel, removes a silver coin and presents it to the ferryman. Charon gazes upon it for a moment, then simply shakes his head. Before Argonus can offer protest, distant sounds rise from the river, whispers echoing off wet stone within the damp cavern. Within moments, new voices join the others, creating a disquieting chorus of shouts and cheers. Argonus weeps at the words of tribute as the souls of slain Argonauts rise from the shadows, appearing before Charon, beseeching, entreating, almost as one voice. As the eyes of Charon move slowly from the spirits to the astonished sailor, Argonus's hand shifts once again, showing that within it, he holds the power of life and death. Charon gazes at the gift from Thanatos, and after what seems to Argonus an eternity, the ferryman relents, motioning the Argonaut to board. As he steps onto the skiff and Charon sets his oar to black waters, a sobering thought enters Argonus's mind. At first, it is a small speck, but it grows even as the sailor's eyes widen in understanding. Athena did not lie. She fulfilled her promise. She granted him a boat from this isle, but not the one he imagined. No, 
not this one. Grasping this great deception, a wave of anger crashes over Argonus, nearly drowning him in its fury. He who had supped, fought, and bled beside hero Jason. He who had sailed seas no man had set or within. He had been played the fool. But even as this vile thought seeks to overcome him, to bring him to his knees, another appears. It is different from the last and whispers something new into Argonus's ear. Something far more powerful. Perhaps he had washed up onto these shores, a sailor, a historian, a map maker, and yes, the puppet of a goddess. Perhaps this was so. But has he not now become so much more? A hero in his own right, with a story yet to complete. Argonus, the rider of Pegasus, liberator of souls, bane of harpies, forger of light, sets his jaw, knowing that Sthenos' retribution must come to an end. And as he stares out beyond the Black River, tendrils of darkness surround the boat, and the underworld claims him as its own. What is that? The Siren Song? How... Argus... No... No! No! Now bend your ear one last time to Calliope lover of Ares, and a muse of much renown. The story of Argonus and the gods of stone has been told in epic verse. And like the namesaked sailor, I too must depart from this isle, putting aside quill and parchment. Argonus and his journey into the underworld continues, but for you and I, the curtain has been drawn. And our role in this grand play is at an end.